Welcome. I am Kaylin Goble, and I am a program development specialist here at OneOp. I will be moderating today's session for us all, and I am happy to welcome you to this webinar on military teen experiences and food security. If you are joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around today. Hopefully, you are currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you are unable to see them or having any other technical difficulties, please email us at contact at oneop.org for tech support. We hope you can join us in the chat pod today for conversations and questions to embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or um, conversation simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen. From there, just click the chat bubble icon. And when typing questions or comments, please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone attending today will be able to view your comments in the chat. Slides and resources are available for download on the webinar event page today, and I will be covering continuing education information at the end of the webinar. So please stay tuned until the very end if you're planning on obtaining CE credits or wish to obtain a certificate of attendance for today. And finally, closed captioning is available for this webinar. You can turn on the subtitles via the Zoom toolbar at the bottom as well. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of professionals supporting our military service members and their families. Among our nation's active duty service members and their families, almost 26% are food insecure. This year, One Ops 2023 Military Family Readiness Academy has addressed food security for military families. To learn more about this year's Academy, we invite you to visit our website, which will be linked in the chat as well as on the event page. We recognize that food security is general is a in general is a very complex issue for all households. This year, along with the MFRA, we have been offering a series of live and on demand webinars addressing food security topics such as today's webinar. Please visit our food security and focus collection page to learn more that is also linked on the event page today. As part of our food security and focus programming, we are presenting a brief video on using the two question food and security screening assessment. These questions are intended to identify at risk service members and families so that they can then be connected to programs that can help. To begin engaging in conversation and assessing a service member's current food security, recognize that food insecurity can occur whenever there is stress on resources in a household, time or money. The key is to start the conversation, perhaps at a morning stand-up, during a feedback session, or any time you may meet with your service members. The USDA defines food security for a household as the means to access by all members at all times to enough food for an active, healthy life. Food insecurity is defined as the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods, or limited or uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in socially acceptable ways. Food insecurity may not always be visible, and asking families about food security may feel intrusive, but it is important to identify families who are food insecure or at risk for becoming food insecure so they may be connected to services. When meeting with families, you might say, the issue of not having enough food or the type of food you need to do your mission is a real concern. There are two proven questions to help understand if you are dealing with food insecurity. I would like to ask them now. If the answer to either question is yes, I want to get you connected to resources that can help, depending on your situation. Please know that food insecurity is just as common for single service members as for married service members. To screen for food insecurity, ask if the following two statements are often true, sometimes true, or never true. Within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we got money to buy more. Within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. A response to either question of often true or sometimes true can indicate potential food insecurity. It is important to understand why the potential exists in order to connect the service member with appropriate resources. You could say, 
I have some resources I want to share with you that can help get you the support you need. To find resources, please visit militaryonesource.mil and find the Economic Toolkit for Service Providers. Scroll down and click on the ACT button to download a PDF of food security resources and programs. If the service member gives a response of never true, you may say that food may become an issue in the future, especially during a move or other transitions. Please reach out or call Military One Source if you need support. If the service member or family is on an installation, you can also suggest they reach out to their Military and Family Support Center. After a service member seeks out additional assistance, continue to follow up on their progress and the resolution to barriers affecting their financial well-being. Along with that um, two screener video, we also wanted to highlight that the USDA has newly released data about US household hold food security in the United States in 2022. You can find more on that data um, in, with the link that Jason just popped in the chat pod, as well as on the resources and um, webinar resources and links PDF available on today's event page. Our presenters will be answering questions at the end of today's presentation if time allows. So please, um, if you do have any questions for them, make sure that everyone is selected in the drop down menu. I will keep a record of those and we will hopefully have time at the end of today's session to cover those. For today's session, we are very happy to be joined by presenters Aspen Bergman, Raleigh Duttweiler and Eileen Huck. Before I hand things over, one more reminder that you can download a PDF presentation handout of today, as well as any webinar resources that we will be highlighting and mentioning um, at the bottom of the event page, and I will be covering CE information at the conclusion of today's presentation. And with that, I'll turn things over to the N N NMFA team to introduce themselves and begin today's presentation. Thank you so much. And it is a mouthful, NMFA. I'm Raleigh Duttweiler, and we are thrilled to be here with you today from the National Military Family Association. I'm joined by my colleagues, Aspen and Eileen, who will introduce themselves in a minute. But first, I want to tell you how I came to NMFA. I grew up in a military family. I married into the military. I have three military kids of my own, and I came to NMFA actually because of the middle one. She was born early. And when you're born early, things can either be really okay and fine or not so great. And she was not so great. And she couldn't digest any food. And she went into shock at her first nurse. It was a whole lot. And we were very overwhelmed. And my husband, who was newly back from deployment, was probably far more overwhelmed than I was. But there was only one formula she could have. And getting it covered by TRICARE proved to be far more arduous than it should have been. In fact, this formula was in the formulary. And we still couldn't get it covered. So we did what parents do. We fed our kid. We drained our bank account, our savings account, everything. $14,000 in the course of two months to pay for her formula while we tried to get it approved. But we just kept hitting roadblock after roadblock. And that's until a friend of mine called NMFA on our behalf. And once they heard our story and had had the whole thing explained to them, within 48 hours, my kid's formula was approved and we had a whole case of it on our front doorstep. I've never been as relieved as I was when I opened the door to the UPS man that day. I don't know where we'd be without NMFA. NMFA cut through the administrative red tape for us. They fought for us and they got our baby what she needed to live. NMFA was there for her. And it's my privilege to make sure that NMFA continues to help other families like ours every day. So we're thrilled to be with you here today to talk about military teens and food insecurity. And the person who has really led the charge on our end for that in the research area is Aspen Bergman. Aspen, why don't you take it from here? Thanks, Raleigh. I'm Aspen Bergman, and I'm also pleased to be able to join you here today. I'm the lead for strategic impact here at NMFA. And that means for the last few years, I have been focused on our data, its collection, and its analysis. So many of us in this space conduct research and collect data, but what makes what we do here at MFA so unique is our emphasis on insights. We want to take the information we're getting and make sure we here at MFA and you, service providers across the country, have what you need to best serve military families. 
While I've gotten to lead our military teen experience survey for the last few years, and with it have learned a tremendous amount about our family's experience with food insecurity, no one's knowledge on this issue is as deep as that of our government relations senior deputy director, Eileen Huck. Eileen, can you introduce yourself? Thank you, Aspen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here today. As Aspen said, my name is Eileen Huck, and I'm a Deputy Director of Government Relations here at NMFA. As part of our government relations team, I monitor issues that are important to military families' quality of life and work with officials at the Department of Defense and on Capitol Hill to find solutions. My focus is primarily on health care, but I also work on children's education and food insecurity, the problem we're here to talk about today. Like Raleigh and Aspen, I'm also a military spouse and mom of military connected kids. Thank you all for your interest in supporting service members and their families. Raleigh, I'll pass it back over to you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So to get started, I want to share what our goals are for our conversation today. Together, we will describe statistics around military teens and their experiences of food insecurity, identify how food insecurity may affect a teen's mental well-being and daily life, examine NMFA resources for teen support, and discuss how local communities, states, and the federal government can respond. Many of you know the National Military Family Association, NMFA. We've been serving and supporting military families for over 50 years with research-driven advocacy and programs that get to the heart of what military families need to thrive. We were founded in 1969 by a group of military spouses determined to do better by their widowed friends. They walked door to door in Congress and their survivor benefit plan was born. But we know that advocacy doesn't happen overnight. It takes years, sometimes decades, like with the survivor benefit plan. But military families shouldn't have to wait for the help they need. And that's why 20 years ago, we launched our first program to meet military families where they are and empower them in the moments they face today, all while we work those long-term solutions in Washington. So at Adam FA, we've been serving and supporting families for over 50 years, and we do that through data-driven policy and programs. It's from those programs that we developed what we refer to as our feedback loop where we talk to and learn from the military families we serve, and then we take what we learn and use it to inform our advocacy and feed it right back into our programs. Two of our signature programs are Operation Purple Camp and our Spouse Scholarship Program. Operation Purple Camp, which you may have heard families refer to as Purple Camp, it goes by many names, but it is still the same goodness, just wrapped up its 20th summer. Through Operation Purple Camp, we offer a free week of sleepaway camp to military kids at locations all over the country. At Operation Purple, they're able to put down the stressors of military life and just be kids, all while connecting with other kids with shared experiences who know what they're going through and building new skills and confidence through all the fun of that classic American summer camp experience. Since its inception, we've put over 60,000 military connected kids through camp, and we're already gearing up for another incredible summer. We also offer a virtual version of the summer camp now in its fourth year. The Operation Purple Summer Challenge is a great option for families who might be far away from our summer camp locations or who have kids like mine with medical concerns that make sleepaway camp a challenge or for kids overseas. The summer we had 1600 families register to join us in our virtual summer program, which totally blew us away. But it's a great program that serves kids we might otherwise be missing. And so we're thrilled to keep it going. And a good example of that is this kid named JP. Uh, JP is eight and we and his family, he, JP and his family spent the summer PCSing and we got to PCS along with them. They were moving from Washington state to the East coast and we got to hang out on zoom in the back of their minivan while they crossed the country where GP, JP joined us for silly hat day. He did Lego challenges with us in the back seat. He participated in dance parties and silly games. It was an incredible thing and a way for us to join him in part of his military kid journey that we would have otherwise missed. It's also an incredible way for us to get to know the families and what they're experiencing today, uh, personal bias. So it's also just like super fun. Um, but our other signature program is our military spouse scholarship program. And that's exactly what it sounds like and more. Our scholarship program offers help with tuition and books like most scholarship programs do. But where we are unique is that we also offer help to pay for your professional license, to relicense or recertify when you move 
We help with small business costs and startup fees, professional development classes, all of the things you might need help investing in as you invest in your own career and accordingly, the financial security of your military family. It's through these programs that we talk to over 10,000 military family members every year, and we don't let that data just sit there. While we talk to families in the flesh and take all of those powerful experiences and connections back into our work, looking at you, JP, in the back of your minivan, we also take the data they give us in our applications and surveys and use it to build real insights that we can use right now today. The development of this feedback loop allows us to look at which populations inside our community might need more attention, and that's actually how our military teen experience survey was born. When the pandemic was started, we were all worried about our kids and how they were doing. We also knew that military teens were largely overlooked, so we partnered with Bloom, empowering the military teen to reach teens where they were and really dig into their experience. Bloom is an incredible organization, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about them later, but they are founded by a group of military teens in the height of the pandemic, and Bloom became a content project for them to share their story, overcome isolation and the geographic separations of military life, and connect with each other. Bloom was more than just a blog and some social spaces. Bloom became community. We're now getting ready for our fourth year of our survey, again, working with Bloom, but not just as partners in a research project. Last year, Bloom came home to NMFA, and it's now NMFA's official teen program. It's an incredible opportunity for us to connect with our military teens of today, and it's an opportunity for us to invest in the Bloom community of tomorrow. Our military teen experience survey is only a part of our overall research, though. Every year, we talk to more than 10,000 military families about their experiences. When they apply for our scholarships, they tell us about their family's financial health, their goals, their aspirations. When they apply for our camps, they tell us about their families and their kids. They tell us about what's keeping them up at night. We're going to be joined by a friend from NMFA in a second, albeit in a pre-recorded video that he made just for us, but we want to share it with you now so that you have a little bit more of an experience of our military kids, our military kids, and our military teens. There are no medals for being the new kid. No glory in a hard goodbye. No salutes for starting over. And over. And over. But there are other things. There's the strength to let go. The resilience to find a new way forward. and the courage to never look back. Operation Purple Camp. Join the mission at operationpurple.org. We are so grateful for The Rock's support, and it's because of him and other partners, supporters, and champions that NMFA has been working on behalf of military families for over half a century, working with families to solve these unique challenges of military life. For the last 20 years, we've been really focused on military family well-being. And to be fair, that was just as true 50 years ago as it is today, but the post-9-11 wars made that support more critical than it had been in generations. And a lot has changed in the last 20 years, even in the last few years. The world shut down in the pandemic, the war in Afghanistan finally came to an end. We celebrated 50 years of an all-volunteer force. Our economy became more challenging than ever for a military family to get by. And through all of it, our military families have continued to serve. Even today, we're seeing how quickly things can escalate and change for our families. We now have 20,000 service members in the Middle East, many of whom have faced unexpected extensions to pre-existing deployments or were just newly deployed without at any time for the families to prepare. It's through this and other experiences that military families share with us what they're going through. They tell us about their problems finding safe and affordable housing, particularly in places like San Diego. Families are forced to choose between homes they can't afford near the installation and homes that require a long commute, taking away precious time with their families after work and between deployments. 
military families tell us how it's hard to find a job and then keep it when they move across state lines. What a challenge it is to find high quality and affordable childcare for their youngest military kids when they do and how hard they have to work to get their teens the support they need to thrive with every new school transition. These are just some of the issues our military community faces today, along with mental well-being, access to high quality, affordable child care, chronic military spouse, un- and underemployment, and financial challenges so real that it leads to food insecurity. At NMFA, we're doing something about it. To tell you more about that, we're first going to go over some basic terms and words that you're going to hear from a lot, hear a lot from us over the next hour, military terms that we also had to learn, and you'll get to learn them now if you don't already know them too. So here are some common terms and also the scales we use um, for our survey and also in our military community. First up, we've got basic BIH, basic allowance for housing. It's an allowance that offsets the cost of housing when you do not receive government provided housing. BIH depends on location, pay grade, and whether you have dependents. BIH rates are set by surveying the cost of rental properties in each geographic location. Therefore, BIH rates in high cost areas will be much greater than those in low-cost areas. BH rates are easy to find and published on the Defense Travel Management Office webpage. Next up, PCS, Permanent Change of Station. It's a long-term assignment, either within the continental U.S. or outside of it. They typically last two to four years. Hidden Helpers. Hidden Helpers are military-connected youth who are involved in the care of a wounded, ill, or injured service member or veteran. These youth are, youth are sometimes directly involved in the care of their service member parent and often take on additional household responsibilities, such as caring for siblings, household chores um, due to their service member's illness or injury. Uh, mental well-being. Um, we, uh, when we talk about mental well-being, we talk about um, um, we talk about in the terms of a broad construct that uh, involves, um, I'm so sorry, I got lost, guys. Let's see, are the scales we used. Um, we used two different validated scales for our teen survey. We employed the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. This is a validated seven item scale that measures the well being and psychological functioning of youth. This instrument captures a wide concept of well being, including emotional, cognitive, and psychological components. We also used the USDA um, short form. It's a six item short form food security survey module to measure the food security of our military connected youth. This validated measure assesses household access to food and eating patterns. Research has rigorously tested this measure with the youth population and found responses to be reliable. A little bit more about that USDA scale. Respondents were asked to report on the food situation in their home in the past month with questions assessing access to food, worry about not having enough food, and changes in eating behavior. For example, did you worry that food at home would run out before your family got money to buy more? Responses included never, sometimes, and a lot. Scores across the six items are summed with a range of zero to nine. A sum score of zero to one means that there were no or minimal reported indications of food access problems or limitations. So these people were food secure or had high food security. A sum score of two to five means there were reports of reduced quality, variety, or desirability of diet with little or no indication of reduced food intake. Those people have low food security. A sum score of six to nine means that there were reports of multiple indications of disrupted eating patterns and reduced food intake. These people reported very low food security. So this is our third year fielding the Military Teen Experience Survey. And we've heard from over 2000 military connected teens and adults each year. We marketed the survey to parents through NMFA's email list and social media channel channels, and we're excited to have a robust response again this year. One of the ways we know we are actually talking to teens is that they often use .edu email addresses when completing the survey. Our survey had 76 questions and took roughly 11 minutes to complete. The survey was voluntary and as such may not be fully representative of the greater military teen population. However, this data still offers important insight into the experiences of today's military teens. 
it's important to note that while we have three years worth of data, our study is cross-sectional in nature, meaning we can't be sure that we're talking to the same people year after year. What we do have, though, is a snapshot of military teen life. We used both quantitative and qualitative measures, which included three validated scales to dig deeper than we have before into mental well-being, food insecurity, and suicidal ideation. Our samples roughly representative of the uniformed services, as I mentioned earlier, and included respondents with service members from all branches. The average age of our teen respondents was 16, and the average age of the entire sample was 18. We chose to expand our age range to include young adults because they have recent experience with military life and may still live at home. A majority of the sample was from active duty families, and additionally, a large subset came from families in which both parents were currently serving or had previously served. Some factors of military life may contribute to greater financial constraints compared to civilian families. For example, relocating frequently, needing childcare during parental deployment, or foregoing additional income to stay home with children. These financial con constraints can impact food security. Literature on food security among military personnel is still emerging. However, in 2012, Feeding America estimated that one quarter of military personnel used food banks to help feed themselves and their families. In 2021, NMFA found that 15% of actively serving personnel polled had visited a food bank in the past 12 months. Additionally, the DOD Department of Defense does not currently track military personnel use of food assistance programs. The distress and anxiety caused by food insecurity is especially salient for military families. Service members who are worried about putting food on the table for their families will struggle with readiness and retention. Poor mental health is associated with intentions to leave the military, and addressing food insecurity may help mitigate mental health concerns, reducing intentions to leave. Stigma also appears to be a major barrier in seeking support for food insecurity. The stigma is especially relevant for junior service members who may be particularly concerned about career advancement. So here are previous findings. Um, in 2022, we found almost half of our 2,254 respondents reported experiencing some level of food insecurity within the past 30 days. About 18% of military teens reported experiencing low food security, and over a quarter experienced very low food security. And if you'll remember, very low food security means the reports of multiple indications of disrupted eating and patterns, or disrupted eating patterns and reduced food intake. In 2023, we spoke to 939 respondents aged 13 to 19. We use the same two scales as in the past year, the USDA Food Security Scale and the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, and we found the following. 37% of our respondents were experiencing some level of food insecurity. That means they either had low or very low food security. Our most startling finding was that, was that hidden helpers, the kids who have a parent who is wounded, ill, or injured, had the highest likelihood of experiencing food insecurity, with nearly 40% reporting very low food security compared to 5% of their peers without a wounded parent. And let me repeat that very low food security means that there are reports of multiple indications of disrupted eating patterns and reduced food intake. When we use the scale, you combine uh, the categories of low and very low. So you ultimately have two categories, food secure and food insecure. Our findings show that those reporting food insecurity were 37%, nearly four times the national average of 10%. It may not be surprising to find that teens with low mental well-being are more represented in the low and very low levels of food security than teens with moderate and high mental well-being. We found a statistically significant correlation between food security and mental well-being. Higher food security is associated with higher mental well-being. This finding is unsurprising considering the negative impact food insecurity has on quality of life and the stress and worry it causes. Perhaps not surprisingly, there's a statistically significant correlation between food security and service member pay grade. Higher pay grade is associated with higher food security. This is consistent with the existing literature, which finds significant associations between lower rank and greater food insecurity. Pay grade is a proxy measure for socioeconomic status in military families. Military families. Therefore, this finding may reflect difficulties with food access due to financial resources. 
Respondents with a wounded, ill, or injured service member were significantly more likely to report food insecurity with respondents than respondents with with respondents of a service member with both a visible and invisible injury reporting the greatest levels of food insecurity. The additional costs associated with caring for an injured service member, including health care, may contribute to lower food security. Other reasons include reduced income as service members may experience employment limitations due to health issues and spouses may be unable to work due to caregiving responsibilities. Respondents from active duty dual military families were significantly more likely to report food insecurity. Dual military families are a severely understudied population. As such, it's difficult to speculate why food insecurity was greater among these families. A greater number of deployments and PCS moves were related to greater reported food insecurity. Changes in family functioning during deployments, such as needing childcare or choosing not to work to avoid high costs of childcare, affect families' finances and may contribute to lower food security. Frequent moves have long hindered military spouses' ability to find and retain steady work, which can impact a family's finances. Further, geographic relocations can be costly, and although the DOD provides financial compensation for such moves, this compensation does not always cover the entire cost of a move, leaving less money available for necessities such as food. So let's talk a little bit about our Operation Purple Camp families. We have the unique opportunity to talk to around 1,500 to 2,000 families every year as they apply for their kids to attend Operation Purple Camp. These families must either currently be serving or previously served in the uniformed services. Families represent all branches of the military and all ranks. They have children between the ages of six and 17. They come from all around the country, but states in which we have a camp location are more represented than others. We use the, food, the USDA food security scale in our application to Operation Purple Camp, and we make sure that applicants understand that admission to the program is not contingent upon their response. So in addition to the teen perspective, we also have the parent perspective. We heard from the parents of 740 teen campers between the ages of 13 and 18. We found that 18% of these families are experiencing food insecurity, nearly two times the national average of 10%. There's a statistically significant correlation between food security and service member rank for parent reports too. Additionally, as household size increases, food security statistically decreases. I'm going to stop here and say it one more time. As household size increases, food security decreases. Larger families mean less food security. Riley, I'm going to hand it back to you. So you may have noticed that there's a disparity between those two food insecurity statistics. Teens are reporting higher rates of food insecurity than parents. This discrepancy has been found in previous literature. Parents may underestimate levels of food insecurity in their households, possibly due to shame or stigma, stigma, and children may be in a better position to reliably and accurately report their food insecurity experiences. Teens and adolescents have been found to be reliable and enthusiastic research participants. The perspective of these teens is important, and their perspective is their reality. And I want to highlight this point about that discrepancy, and I want to talk to you briefly about our experience with military families and military teens in particular in Southern California. So as we go through all of our data, we're able to see that some there are some places where these financial problems that military families are facing, the kind of problems that can lead to food insecurity in their homes, food insecurity in their teens, are worse. Southern California is crazy expensive for everyone, and military families are no exception. They just didn't choose to live there. They were sent there by the military. So we've started building a lot of on-the-ground community connections and support programs throughout the Southern California region to try to support these families that we know are in the thick of it, trying to make their finances stretch. And most recently, one of those is with the Department of Parks and Rec in LA County. We have a good amount of military family stationed in or near LA. And for those families, Parks and Rec is a really, really important support. They're also the area's biggest employer of teens. So as I was working with our head of Parks and Rec to build some programming specifically for our military families in the area, she mentioned how much she loved Bloom, that we're trying to make sure that it grows, that they're expanding their teen programs too. Why? Because, she said, 
her teens, the teens and her staff, the teens and her programs, the teens using Parks and Rec throughout LA County, they are experiencing food insecurity at higher rates than everyone else in their programming atmosphere. It's not just us, it's also them. They're solving this by adding a teen center to every major park. And while that teen center can be a place for community and connection, it's also a really intentional place to put a fridge and shelf stable food. She's making sure that LA County teens are fed, and she's working with us to make sure that military teens in her community are connected with support and with others too. And that's where Bloom comes in. Bloom is this incredible community created by military teens for military teens. And you'll hear more about that later and how the military teens you interact with can access their resources and become part of this vibrant community. But I want to mention Bloom's field guide to the military teen here, which we will also have linked at the end of this presentation. It's by our military teens, about our military teens, and for communities with military teens, like LA County, like wherever you are. And because it's written in their voice, Voice, it also offers their unique perspective on their experiences. It's a must read for anyone who works with military connected teens. As service providers, food insecurity needs to be a top consideration when talking to these military teens. Food insecurity is an acute stressor with well established links to mental health and well being. Shame and stigma surround the issues of food insecurity and hunger, and that's especially true in our military family community. Teens can try to hide their experiences, but the stress will come out in other ways. Military teens, especially hidden helpers, take on additional household responsibilities, and the stress of food insecurity may have an even larger impact on them, and by extension, their mental health. And this is where I want Eileen to come talk to us about Adam FA's food security advocacy. She has so much to add, and Eileen, we are looking forward to your perspective and knowledge. Thanks so much, Raleigh. I appreciate that. So I want to start off by explaining that, as many of you know, uh, Low-income civilian families who are dealing with food insecurity can often turn to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP, um, for, for, for additional uh, nutrition support. However, SNAP benefits are not available to most military families because their basic allowance for housing is counted when determining eligibility. This is especially a problem in high income areas uh, that Aspen alluded to earlier. Uh, these in a high income area, your BAH might be well above the national average, but that doesn't take into account the high cost of living in those areas like Southern California and elsewhere. And that basic allowance for housing puts a nutrition assistance like SNAP out of reach. This problem is getting worse as housing costs continue to outpace BAH, and this is putting families under increasing strain. So we've been advocating on behalf of military families about this issue for years, and we're very pleased that Congress and DOD have finally started to recognize that food insecurity is affecting military families. In November of 2021, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin directed the department to create a toolkit to help military commanders recognize signs of financial stress among families and point them to resources. Even more significantly, the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2022 included a basic needs allowance or BNA for low income military families. This allowance provides a temporary pay boost to families whose incomes and household sizes place them below 130% of federal poverty guidelines. The following year, Congress increased that income threshold to 150% of federal poverty guidelines. However, because the basic allowance for housing is included in determining eligibility for the basic needs allowance, we've seen that few families are able to qualify. We're supporting legislation that would remove the housing allowance in determining BNA eligibility so more families can access this vital benefit. The longer term solution, which NMFA supports, is to revise the rules around SNAP eligibility so that BAH is excluded from eligibility calculations. We're urging Congress to make this much needed change when it reauthorizes the farm bill, which we expect to happen sometime next year. Raleigh, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Eileen. I always feel like whenever you talk about what we're doing policy-wise, I learned so much and I am heartened that there are advocates out there working to affect change for our military family members experiencing food insecurity. Um, you've heard so much 
about our families, the teens in our community. And we are really lucky to be able to have this close relationship with our military teens um, in the form of Bloom alive in-house at MFA and help it grow. What started as a community by teens and for teens has grown into a leadership team that is able to help grow up while still making bloom by teens and for teens, but now with the infrastructural support of MFA to ensure that it will still be here in a decade. Bloom is now our official teen program, but it is above all else, a digital community. They have a website with content made and curated by military teens, sharing their stories, their experiences, and social pages that amplify that work. But it's also this leadership development program, an opportunity for teens to engage in program ideation, for them to think through better ways that MFA and the rest of the community and service providers like you can better support military teens like them. It's home to a vibrant community at installations around the world with these young adults empowered to speak in their community. I have a fire alarm going off. I apologize if you hear that. There is no actual fire. Um, it's a vibrant community. And these young adults are empowered to speak up wherever they are, stand up for themselves and teens just like them and raise their voices so that we can all make our community stronger. I'm going to wrap this up because I'm assuming this fire alarm is as annoying for you as it is for me. And I do want to make sure my house isn't on fire. But today, Eileen and I are also going to be presenting at Purple Star USA, a conference for schools and administrators who serve military kids, where a panel of Bloom teens are speaking to school administrators from around the country about what's working in public schools for them and what isn't. And earlier this month, one of our Bloom leaders was celebrated at the White House for International Day of the Girl. These kids are doing incredible things, and it's a privilege for us to be able to support them, shine the light on what they're doing, and further enable their growth. And that's really what we do here at NMFA. We want our military family to grow and to grow stronger. Bloom impressed us right away, but it was the data our surveys revealed that convinced us we needed to find a way to preserve and maintain it. Our data about teens, our data about food and security, our data about financial well-being in general, all of it is the reason for what we do and for the new ways we'll respond to families' needs going forward. Now that you've listened to us for the better part of an hour and my fire alarm, you are all part of that. You're part of this community and we're counting on you to better support our kids and families and make all of us healthier, stronger, and thriving. At NMFA, we always say together we're stronger and it's true. It starts right here with you and we are grateful to be serving this community together. Aspen, do you mind doing the resources while I make sure that there actually is nothing happening with this alarm in my house? Not at all, Raleigh. Thank you. I'll be right back, guys. <laughs> all right, guys. Um, here's a list of resources we've compiled that we encourage you to go through, learn from, and use. All of these are in the event page, so you can download it too. If there are more resources you want to know about, we've got them. This is just a short curated consumable list. I think I'm passing it back over to Kaylin now. Thank you, Aspen. It doesn't look like we've had any questions come through. So if you do have any questions at all for um, Raleigh, well, Aspen and Eileen today, please let us know in the chat. Um, I'm going to be keeping a look out on that in case we have any questions come through. And I guess here as we wrap things up, I just was wanting to see if you had any final messages for our service providers that are joining us today that do work at that really local um, and community level with our our military teens really within those clinical settings um, and how they can mobilize kind of this great content that um, the National Military Family Association has and, and data and really rich, rich research. If y'all have any light last minute highlights or notes um, on that for them. Um, sure. I mean, like like Raleigh said, um, you know, we we have we have resources. We have got um, you know this amazing, vibrant Bloom community that you can point your um, your the the teams that you work with to. Um, it's they have they've got such great information, and it's such a strong community where you feel like you're not alone. Um, and then also just the data that we've been collecting, we will we'll field, I think, our fourth year of the Military Teen Experience Survey um, coming up this spring. So, you know, be on the lookout for that. Um, I, I anticipate, you know, 
or and, and I anticipate that we'll we'll be asking even more questions about um, you know military teen mental health coming up too. So please just just stay in contact with us and continue to do the best you can for the kids you work with. Wonderful. Thank you, Aspen. And again, that um, field guide is linked in our resources for today's webinar, but I would highly recommend giving that a look, especially I know a lot of times we'll have um, folks joining us who may be in their um, who may be in their study group right now, who may be grad students or those that are preparing to go into the field of working with military families. And we highly recommend checking out that field guide. It is, as um, our presenters have said, today a really great kind of snapshot to hear from the teens themselves. Um, it does look like we had one question come through. If you could speak a little bit more, I know you mentioned it um, earlier in the session, if there are any specifics on food insecurity for those outside of the continental U.S. areas or if y'all have seen any trends with that for folks that are stationed outside of the U.S. Yeah, I'll take that question, and I'm so glad that it came up because it's a very important issue. We do know that families overseas struggle with food insecurity, uh, and there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that military spouses can find it hard to find employment overseas, and so we see families even more so than uh, families stationed in the United States who are struggling to get by on one income. And there are oftentimes fewer resources available to, um, to support families who are finding themselves struggling with food insecurity. One resource that does exist that we're very proud of is WIC Overseas. Um, uh, several decades ago, we became aware that families who were stationed overseas didn't have access to WIC benefits because that's a program that's administered by the states. And so we went to the Department of Defense and worked with them to establish the WIC overseas program that's uh, administered by the Defense Health Agency uh, to provide similar uh, WIC benefits to low income military families with pregnant uh, moms or young children. Uh, it's not a perfect program. It relies on paper vouchers. It hasn't advanced uh, technologically the way that we would like to see, but it is a resource that's available for uh, families who are stationed overseas. And Kaylin, thank you for uh, posting that link. I appreciate it. Um, I also more broadly wanted to encourage our service providers to be sure that they're uh, advising military families that they work with that they might be eligible for WIC. Uh, just because of the demographics of the military population, uh, lots of families with young children, uh, we do find that a large percentage of our military families are potentially eligible for support through WIC. That's also because the basic allowance for housing is generally not included in determining eligibility. Um, and so, you know, as you're working with young military families uh, in particular, uh, please just check to see whether they're aware of WIC. Uh, many of them are not, uh, or think that they might not be eligible when in fact they are. So. Um, you know, that would be something really helpful. We're working hard to raise awareness of that, and we would appreciate it if the service providers working directly with military families could, could assist us with that. Thank you, Eileen. And we will actually get that uh, link added to the event page today, so any folks listening to the archived recording today can also access that resource. So thank you so much, Eileen. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move into wrapping things up, but please do let us know if you have any last minute questions come through. Um, thank you so much, all three of y'all, for such a powerful presentation and, and for really highlighting the work that y'all are doing at the National Military Family Association for our families and for our military teens. It's really spectacular. Um, for those who have joined us today, the link for the evaluation will be available on the event page. When you visit the event page, you will see the purple button like the one on the screen currently being shown. Click that and it will take you to both the evaluation and the post test. If you are not seeing that right now, please refresh your page. We add that live at the end of the webinar, so um, you may not see that if you've had the page pulled up for a bit. Your feedback is very important to us, so we do ask our audience to take a short evaluation, letting us know your thoughts on today's webinar, as well as potential thoughts for um, upcoming programming. For those wanting to obtain the CE credit, after the evaluation, you will be directed to a list of opportunities offered for today's session. CE credits will be available from the University of 
of Texas at Austin Steve Hicks School of Social Work, the Commission for Case Manager Certification, the Patient Advocate Certification Board, the American Association for Family and Consumer Sciences, the National Council on Family Relations, and the Commission on Dietetic Registration. Some of the certificates require the completion of a post-test, so you may be directed to do that. Once the post-test has been completed with an 80 per score of 80% or higher, the certificate should be emailed to your provided email within 24 to 48 hours of completing that process. Some email providers will kick that to your spam folder, so please check there first if you have not received that directly to your inbox. Um, and then if you have not received that certificate, it within a day or so um, and you've checked your spam folder and um, you've exhausted all those options, please feel free to email us at oneopfamilydevelopment at gmail.com and we will be happy to assist you in making sure you do receive your certificate for today's time. I will be putting that email in the chat pod now. Um, so yes, if you don't get that, please feel free to email us. We will be continuing our conversation around food um, insecurity in our next webinar, Supporting Military Teens, Community, Healthy Living, and Food Security Programs. We invite you to join us for that webinar on December 7th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. This presentation will describe the benefits and importance of addressing food security and health initiatives within your communities, identify ways to incorporate healthy living and food security initiatives locally, and and discuss the AmeriCorps VISTA 4-H partnership and identify uh, resources offered through their partnership as well that you can mobilize um, within your communities. You can RSVP now on the event page, which Jason just linked in the chat pod. And of course, CE credits and certificates will be available for participants of that session. So if you would like to go ahead and mark your calendar, please go ahead and RSVP for that and you will get that information in your inbox to secure that date. Um, as always, we thank you so much for joining us today as we continue the conversation on expanding food security for military families and mobilizing professionals at federal, state, and local levels to work together to ensure that shared goal. Again, the Food Security and in Focus Initiative also offers additional suites of resources, which include additional webinars that you can utilize, has some also some other really, really great resources that you can use in your communities and in your work with military families. Um, that is linked on the event page again if you would like to check out those additional resources as well. And thank you so much for your time today. If you enjoyed this webinar then please be sure to check out our website at oneop.org. We have a lot of different topic areas that you can utilize and join us in different programming to mobilize in your support of military families at local, state, and federal levels. Um, we will keep the room open here for a little bit more, for a little bit longer um, for to ensure that you grab any last minute links or anything. Thank you all again for your um, attendance today and and for, to our three presenters for such a wonderful session and for including, um, including your personal stories. That was really powerful to hear. Thank you so much, Raleigh, for beginning, um, for beginning us and opening up the session in that way. So yes, uh, please feel free to grab any last minute links. Um, and again, please email us if you have any additional questions and we look forward to receiving your um, feedback in our evaluations and looking through those. Thanks so much.
Thank you all so much. I think we are going to wrap the room up. Just one final note that that DOD WIC Overseas Program link um, to the USDA website has been added to the event page um, for anyone going forward that would like to check that resource out um, and see if their families are eligible for that. Thank you again so much, Eileen, Aspen, and Raleigh. Uh, Raleigh, we are very happy to hear that all is good to go with your house um, and that that fire alarm was just um, a dud going off. So thank, thanks to hear that. And thank you all so much for your time today. We are going to close the room and we appreciate your attendance. Thanks so much.